in the United States, maternal mortality exceeds maternal mortality in any other Western country. Uh, these are data up to 2015, but updated data suggest we've made a little bit of improvement, but are still significantly higher than other countries. And uh, although more patients with congenital heart disease are considering pregnancy, it's really related to acquired heart disease that the, the maternal mortality has increased. And you can see here the most common cause of pregnancy-related death in the U.S. are cardiovascular disorders. Here you can see cardiomyopathy and then hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. So uh, a major impact uh, of cardiovascular disease on this. And so there's been a lot of interest and enthusiasm in trying to alter that. So let's look at the case. This is a 30-year-old female with com repaired complete AV canal. So similar to what Will had shown with an AV canal, but this patient had complete AV canal. She's not Down syndrome, she, which is a common association. So um, shortly after birth, she had repair of complete AV canal with a single patch technique and mitral valve repair. That was at three months of age. And within two weeks, it was recognized that she had severe left AV valve or mitral valve regurgitation, and she had re-repair. So I don't know if you really call that two sternotomies, but she had early re-repair. And then 1992 had mitral valve replacement with a 16 millimeter carbomedix valve. So you can see that she was only a year old at that time. And then uh, 10 years later had mitral valve replacement with a 23 millimeter carbomedix mechanical valve at age 11 years. So four sternotomies, I guess the second one was really quite um, short after the first one. So she presents to us um, fairly recently with no symptoms. She's on warfarin for her mechanical left AV valve prosthesis, has a home INR monitor, and her dose of warfarin is seven milligrams, alternating with six milligrams daily. Her exam is noteworthy for a normal mechanical S1 and S2, and she has a brief systolic murmur, but otherwise it's relatively unremarkable. Here's her chest X-ray and electrocardiogram, and um, this nicely demonstrates what we mentioned, the left axis deviation that's so common in the patients, and incomplete right bundle that's so, or, so common in patients with AV canal defects. First degree AV block can also frequently be seen. And so no mystery on this echo, we're looking at her left AV valve prosthesis, you can see that there's narrowing of the left ventricular outflow tract, fortunately no LV outflow tract obstruction. And then we'll just buzz through this because I just wanted to include it and emphasize that it looks pretty normal. So ventricular function looks normal, end diastolic dimension is 36, outflow tract dimension 1.8, pulmonary regurgitant and diastolic velocity, one meter per second. And you can see the um, early uh, signal was also not uh, real high. And then we're looking at the, trying to get the outflow tract here. So left ventricle, right ventricle, AV valve. She had a little bit of flow acceleration in the left ventricular outflow tract. Peak velocity was one eight. And then her AV valve gradient mitral gradient was five millimeters of mercury. And TR velocity, two meters per second. So of course, she wants to consider a pregnancy, so we want to see how she does uh, under um, uh, non-pregnancy related stress. So she has an exercise, a cardiopulmonary exercise test, exercise 10 minutes, 88% of predicted, her peak VO2 was also really pretty good, 25.1, 73% of predicted uh, for her, and no high-risk features. So just to summarize, complete AV canal, repaired early in life, so she had a single patch and mitral repair. She had early post-op which was re-repaired, and then she had uh, AV valve replacement times two, and currently has a mechanical uh, left AV valve and is stable on warfarin. So what would you recommend about pregnancy? Should be okay, advise against, send her elsewhere to have that discussion.
should be okay. Many of you are much braver than I am, I think. Um, okay, so let's look at this a little bit more um, and ask you, what's the chance of a favorable pregnancy outcome and live birth in this patient? Is it 30%, 70%, or 90%? So the middle answer is always the one that people defer to most. And I think if we look at what is the patient's risk, um, there's a lot of interest in classifying the risk of pregnancy related to certain cardiovascular disorders. And I've made this table, modified it from the European Heart um, uh, Guidelines. So the ESC has pregnancy and heart disease guidelines and the references uh, um, listed here. And so I've modified that uh, table just a little bit. But you can see that if we're talking about patients who have a mechanical valve prosthesis, regardless if it's um, uh, AV valve or semilunar valve, um, the risk to the mother is not insignificant. So 20 to 27% in this particular um, classification, regardless of, again, what type of valve that is. But there are data that suggest that the chance of a successful pregnancy, so that's incorporating not just maternal risk, but also the chance of a successful delivery um, actually is quite a bit less. So from the ROPEC registry, which is a European registry looking at uh, pregnancy outcomes in different disorders, they looked at the chance of an event-free pregnancy and live birth in patients who had a mechanical valve and were managed with various anticoagulation regimens and the chance was 58%. More recent data from the UK suggests that a favorable outcome for mother and baby is only 28% if the patient has a mechanical heart valve and is man managed during pregnancy. And so I think it's just worth talking about this because you'll see these patients in your practice and it really is important to discuss the risk of pregnancy to the mother and the chance of a successful pregnancy um, for that individual so that they're aware of this. So of course, the thing that we worry about most is mechanical valve thrombosis and the risk is significant during pregnancy. And of course, in this situation, we have that balance of maternal and fetal risks and I'll go through the different anticoagulation regimens and some are better for the mother and some are better for the baby but there's no perfect blend. And here you have the potential to have a 200% um, uh, complication rate or mortality rate. So let's look at the different anticoagulation options. Warfarin, also known as vitamin K antagonist, has a low molecular weight. It crosses the placenta. The fetus is anticoagulated, and so there are increased risks to the fetus when warfarin is used during a pregnancy but for sure it's the safest anticoagulation for the mother. So the things that we worry about with regard to um, warfarin is um, fetal loss and then also that risk of embryopathy, which we know is likely dose-related from a small studies. Unfractionated heparin is not a good anticoagulation um, regimen for who want to consider a pregnancy, except for right around the time of delivery, where it's the treatment of choice. It's unreliable, it needs to be given intravenously, and so it's really not a good um, a treatment option. And low molecular weight heparins don't cross the placenta, um, but it's very important to recognize that weight-based therapy is inadequate in the pregnant patient. So if one uh, decides to go with low molecular weight heparin, then it must be monitored and adjusted by anti-10A levels. And then direct oral anticoagulants should not be used in pregnancy. This is a schema that was uh, published in 2017 and I think is helpful for us to understand some of the problems, but also when we're explaining it to patients. So our patient is on a high dose vitamin K, so a dose that's above five milligrams per day so if she continues with warfarin during the pregnancy, the risk to her is low, 5%. But notice here that 
to the baby is about 35%. So the overall risk for her um, successful pregnancy and or delivery is about 40%. And then you can see the different regimens for different patient characteristics. And so I've just included this for your reference uh, from the ESC guidelines again for a patient who has a mechanical valve and is in high dose vitamin K antagonist. And again, that's a dose that's greater than five milligrams per day because again, several small studies have suggested that a dose less than five milligrams per day um, does, is associated with a lower risk of fetal loss. Um, and then I think the other thing that's worth mentioning is that if the patient elects to transition from warfarin to low molecular weight heparin, it needs to be done in a high-risk patient like this in the hospital, and I've included that, the regimen for that uh, in, the, in your handout. And I think in the interest of time, we won't go through that regimen um, today. So um, these patients are very challenging to evaluate, um, to counsel, and then to manage. So you really need to have a motivated patient and a motivated healthcare team to take care of this patient population. And as was referenced in the European guidelines for pregnancy-related um, heart disease, I think a pregnancy heart team is ideal for this patient population. And so that would in include a motivated patient, um, a cardiologist, maternal fetal medicine, um, obstetric anesthesiologist, and then an expert in the care of anticoagulation. Um, and that may be the cardiologist and or a thrombophilia specialist uh, for this particular patient. So we reviewed all of that information with our patient and she's still considering her option. She hasn't uh, decided to proceed with pregnancy yet. So really important to outline the plan of care. Just counsel the patient that we're willing to support them, but it's a high risk to both mother and fetus. And maybe the outcome in this patient is about 30% successful pregnancy outcome. And they need to be aware of that. So a detailed discussion about the risk, and you need, as I said, a motivated patient and care team. And then therapeutic anticoagulation is absolutely mandatory in this patient population. And again, um, outlined in the handout will be how to manage those patients. So therapeutic warfarin, if that, that's the decision to continue that, and remember that the dose of warfarin will also change during pregnancy in this patient population.